I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. For a lot of you who are looking at maybe moving to a new country for the very first time, becoming new expats, if you will, you may be facing the realities of importation for the first time in your life, and there may be aspects of this you've never considered, including what even is an import. Of course, you know the word, but do you know how it applies to everyday life? Probably not, because why would you? Whoever has to deal with this until you become an expat? Obviously, if you're an importer, exporter. Duh. But for most of us, the first time that we actually deal with any amount of importation is when we become an expat and suddenly an entire world of international shipping and logistics becomes something that we deal with every day and we're often caught off guard about it. So let's talk about what exactly is an import right after the buck. We all know this story, mostly because you watch my channel and I tell this story, but you're coming into a new country. We'll just say it's Honduras. You're landing at the airport. You've got loads of stuff in your luggage and you need to go through customs. What is customs? Well, customs is that step after border control, but it's still kind of part of the border where they go through your stuff and they ask you normally some pretty simple questions. Like, do you have anything to declare? Meaning, are you bringing in something that you're not allowed to just bring in and you have to let us know about? That's what that means. That's what a declaration form is for. And in many cases, you're going to be entering a country, they're going to have a piece of paper or an electronic thing that you need to fill out. For example, coming into Nicaragua, it's paper and Guatemala, it's electronic. And you have to let them know if you have anything to declare. Now, of course, they're going to give you a list of things you need to declare dairy products, meat products, fruit products, for sure, you got to declare fruit people. I know it sounds like the craziest thing, but it's one of the most important things you have to declare and any amount of currency of any sort that is worth more than $10,000 US denomination. Okay, so all of those things are things you need to declare, as are any things that jump, just don't count as regular goods that you're bringing during your travels. Well, what does this mean? Well, let's step back. Let's talk about the concept of importation. What does it mean to import something? Now, let's start with an example. So you are a Canadian and you live in Canada, as many Canadians do. It's a popular choice for Canadians. And as you live there, you would like to get some products, let's say a jug of milk. You order it from the local store or you just go pick it up yourself, whatever. So you get that milk, you bought it from the local store, you don't have to import anything, you don't have to think about importing anything. Why? Because that milk came from Canada, you're buying it in Canada, you're gonna drink it in Canada. It's not going anywhere. It's 100% Canadian product, so there's no importation. But now let's say you're going to get a car. There are cars made in Canada, but the most are not. The most, the majority, are not. So let's say you're going to get a Nissan, you're gonna have it brought in from Japan, as some are. So you're gonna get this, probably one of the sports models, right? If you get one of the regular models, it's just kind of come in from Michigan like everything else. So you're gonna get one of these sports Smile, specifically made in Japan. It's going to be imported. It comes on a barge, but you're buying it at a dealership. You didn't like go out and talk to someone in Japan and have this put on a boat for you. You just went to the dealership and had this product that's a little bit specialty shipped over. Same with a BMW, for example. No problem. So is this an import? Yes, it is. But who handled the importation? Well, it's some combination of BMW in Germany or Nissan in Japan and the dealership or the dealership association or something of that sort or maybe Nissan Canada and they paid to bring that car in dealt with any complexities that may go along with that dealt with the port and customs and importation taxes and duties all that stuff and then it was put at the dealership and when you bought it yes it was already imported so it's an import but you're not importing it and so that's the way that most people deal with things that have been imported you don't have to deal with anything behind the scenes you don't actually have to know you're not responsible for knowing that it's imported of course some people want to know where products are made whether they just want to support local goods or they just want to support goods from a certain place or they think certain countries have better value or quality Whatever. There's lots of reasons why you may want to be aware of importation status, but it doesn't mean that it's something you actually have any legal obligation to know anything about. Now, what if you were online, you're talking to someone, and my niece is an importer, right? So she does a lot, way more of this than I do. She can go talk to someone in Pakistan, real thing that she does, talks to people on the ground, mostly artisans, has discussions with them and says, hey, you have this product that I'm interested in. I'd like to get it. But they're just some guy in Pakistan. They don't have any deal to get things into the U.S. They don't 
don't have any exportation deals, nothing of the sort, and she's just someone in the United States and wants to buy those products. So how is she going to get it? In this case, she needs to be her own importer. Now, there's a couple ways she can do this. She can either, and she would be better at telling you about this than I am for sure, she can go through someone like UPS or FedEx who has their own importation department, and they'll handle that stuff for you at incredible cost. A lot of us have done, a lot of us have done this for one-off items. It's like, it's not worth having any effort. It's not worth just, just pay UPS to have it done. And you spend like a hundred dollars to bring like, you know, a donut over the border from Canada. And then you realize how sorry you are that you did that. But the simplest little thing, you want to send someone a Christmas card, anything more than just an envelope. And suddenly you have these massive fees from UPS or FedEx because it's so costly to import something over a border. So that's one thing she could do. She could just use UPS or FedEx and have them pay for everything. Or she could use a different type of shipper, have it put onto a cargo ship or any number of things, right? You see all these Maersk and all these advertisings for, for big logistics firms that ship things. They will ship. Normally, you're not going to ship a little box with them. You're going to ship something big like a pallet. But you want to ship some stuff. You ship it from Pakistan. It's coming to Canada. Well, then it arrives at the ship and you've got to deal with customs and all that. Now, there may be an agent that you work with at the port. You may talk to the port and say, I'm expecting this thing. This is where it's going. Here's I'll pay the fees. It depends on your country. It depends on what you're doing. There's a lot of different processes, but behind the scenes, this is what's happening. They're putting it on a ship. Someone in Pakistan is making sure that it is allowed to leave the country. Now, if it's just, you know, some artisan products, it's not going to be a problem. Someone just wants to look at it, make sure that that's actually what it is, right? They don't want to be shipping something illegal, drugs or something like that weapons internationally without someone knowing like you got to really check those things so there's a lot of expensive process that goes to import and export now that's the export process in canada when it arrives you're going to take it off a ship and they're going to have to inspect it to make sure that it's something legitimate now if they don't suspect anything this may be a 30 second process if they suspect something it could be a month-long process i've definitely seen products get stuck in customs for ridiculously long periods of time it can happen so this is something that then generally most countries make you pay for you're going to have to pay for this the processing normally that there's a fee for bringing stuff in you have to pay taxes in many cases because you're bringing something in that taxes have not been paid on and now you want to consume it potentially sell it inside the country so someone's got to pay taxes under normal circumstances and there may be in many cases duties for example you want to bring an electric car in from china to the united states there's a duty on that of 100 percent whatever you paid in china you need to pay again to the u.s government and then all your taxes and so forth after that point so those things are all things that need to be considered now if you're just bringing in artisan products again i don't know any country that charges additional duties on that but they can for sure so just things you need to be aware of so importation generally has a bunch of stuff that goes with it but it's easy to picture this when you live in canada for example, you know exactly when you're going to be doing importing because you're either going to pay a huge importation fee from a FedEx, a UPS, something like that, or you're going to be dealing with the port directly and managing the process of importing something and getting it shipped to you and paying all these duties and fees. And the idea is pretty straightforward. If it's something that is created inside Canada, inside your own country, and never leaves it, then it's not an import. If you have to bring something in from the outside to a country and it's going to stay there, it is an import. Now, there are cases where someone may cross. So for example, an American goes into Canada for the afternoon and they have clothes on, they have a phone in their pocket, they may have a backpack and they've got a laptop and a change of clothes and all that stuff. Are they importing those things? Well, you could argue that they are importing them and we just call it a temporary import. In most cases, we don't refer to it that way. We think of it as just the items you're traveling with. They're just personal items. Uh, whichever way you look at it, the point is that those items are going to leave the country again or be consumed in a very temporary way. For example, if you were to cross with an apple, don't do that. That's illegal. But if you were to cross with a snack and you immediately ate it, people generally don't consider that a big deal because it's such a tiny amount of money. It was consumed by someone who's going to go back. And technically, if you don't have to use the bathroom before you leave, you did return to its original country with it. And no one wants to check on that. So that's all OK. But if your laptop, your clothing, those are all going to go back to wherever you came from with you, whether it's tonight or tomorrow or in a month. Not a problem. But if you were to bring those things and then sell them while you're in Canada, that would be an import. Now, it's something you may get away with, but there's a difference between whether it is or is not an import and whether or not you got away with it. Yes, it's easy to trick someone. And the government of Canada is not super concerned that you're sneaking in one change of clothing and deciding to sell it in Canada. At most, it's going to be pennies that you're talking about of importation tax, and they don't want to deal with something that small anyway. And generally, there's some minimum where it's only worth a couple dollars, so no one cares, right? There's 
there's always some amount of fudge factor just because there's paperwork involved. But the idea of importation is clear. You brought it in, it didn't leave, that makes it an import, whether it's officially an import, whether it's taxed or not. Okay. So when you're an expat and you're coming into a new country, into your new home country, many people then are not aware of importation. They never think about this in terms of where the items are going and where they're staying, and that's what makes the difference. So you're coming into let's say Honduras, like we use in our example, you're coming from Canada, coming to Honduras, and you bring in, again, that change of clothes, your laptop, that Apple, whatever, and you're just going to use it until you go back to Canada. You're in for the weekend, you're enjoying one weekend on the beach, you wanted your laptop, and you want to be able to change your clothes after you go swimming. Totally understandable. No problem at all. Honduras is not going to flag this as an import. They know you're going to use it and return to Canada with it, and hopefully you're not going to take your one pair of dirty clothing and try to sell them on the street while you're in Honduras. Not the worst thing in the world if you did, but let's not do that. Okay. So that's not an import because it was just temporarily in the country. But what if you came with a few extra things, right? You came in with a few things and you sold them while you're in Honduras. You brought them for the purpose of selling. Those are imports. Now, again, Honduras may not catch you if it's some tiny amount of stuff and they may not even care if it's super, super tiny, but that doesn't change the fact that you are importing something. You just may be sneaking in under a certain limit. Just like in the United States, if you only earn $500 in a year, you don't owe any taxes, but it doesn't change the fact that you earned money and have to file taxes. They may not fine you for not filing your taxes, but you're still supposed to do it and let them know that you didn't earn enough to bother paying and they'll just say okay that's cool and let it go so that's how it's supposed to work. Now, when you're bringing in lots of stuff, if you're coming into Honduras and you've decided you're not going to leave Honduras, something special happens, not legally, just in your brain. And that thing is, is that things that you used to bring in that made sense. You're coming from Canada, you're bringing a laptop, you're bringing some changes of clothes, you're bringing whatever for your vacation. And you were taking those more or less right back to Canada. But now if you're coming to Honduras and you're planning on never leaving Honduras, chances are, not necessarily, but chances are, you're going to bring a lot of stuff, a whole bunch of things that you would never have considered bringing previously. And unlike when you're coming down to visit for the weekend, you're not bringing things, at least not entirely things, that you plan on taking back to Canada with you. You're bringing things that you're thinking about leaving behind in Honduras. And this starts to change everything. So first of all, anything that you bring without the intention of taking back, that is an import. Right. And so when you're doing this move, instead of it being five dollars of stuff, ten dollars of stuff, it suddenly might be five or ten thousand dollars worth of stuff. It's a completely different game. And instead of a few things that may have a small percentage that gets left behind, maybe you're talking about a large number of things that are clearly going to be left behind and are very easily to easy to identify that they're not returning to Canada. So the, the whole game changes very quickly. And this is where a lot of people coming into a new country as new expats have this mentality of you can just cross the border with anything you want because when you were truly a traveler, meaning you were just coming for maybe up to a month, everything you brought with you was definitely something you cared about enough that either you're going to consume it while you're there, toothpaste, for example, that's fine, uh, or you were going to return to your home country with it. That change of clothes, you were going to wash it or keep it in a bag and take it back. You were not going to just abandon your clothes while you're there. And if you were, it was such a tiny amount of stuff that no one cared. But once you're a staff, establishing an apartment, a house, storage unit, whatever, in your new country, now you have a way to leave things behind. And now because you have this tradition, most of us do. We've traveled throughout our lives. We're used to being able to bring things and we don't have to think twice about it. It never, ever would cross our minds that we might be importing something because why would we ever do that? We're not going to leave something behind. Not intentionally. You might forget something in the hotel. I totally did that with a camera in Washington, D.C. in 1993, and it still bothers me to this day. It was an Olympus RC 35mm rangefinder. Absolutely love that camera. I do have a replacement Olympus rangefinder digital that I now use. It's one of my favorite cameras. I still feel bad about that camera. Anyway. I digress. You're not intentionally going to be leaving stuff behind. It's all going to be accidental, like the GoPro that was stolen from me in Managua three years ago. Also a little bit salty about that. But OK, so when you are doing this as a new expat, you still have this mentality and you can see it in expats that ask these questions all the time on the channel. It's a very common question. Well, is this an import? Is that an import? Why would they act this way about this thing? And it's also true that if you're coming into someplace like the United States, there has a tendency to overlook a large number of things coming into the country. That's just 
something the US is pretty lax about. They're very open to you bringing more than you would likely use on a vacation into the country, and they just look the other way. It's just the American culture. I have no idea what makes them tune things this way. Canada goes very much the other way. You can actually bring, as a foreigner going into Canada, you can't even bring close to what you can bring into Nicaragua. You can't bring a laptop into Canada without it being a problem. You might be able to get away with it if you have a good explanation, but like my business partner went there one time with a laptop and was told it was a one-time allowance and he'd never be allowed into Canada again if he did that. Like seriously, that was a long time ago when Canada was considered a nice and open and friendly. I can't even imagine what it's like now. So going into Canada, if like you don't realize this as a Canadian, just how little you're allowed to import during your vacation that may be a problem. Nowhere near what you're allowed to bring into, say, Nicaragua, which is nowhere near allowed what you're allowed to bring into a Honduras, for example. Honduras lets you bring in more or less anything, really, including a drone which is very handy. Anyway, so you can uh, see where the mentality starts to be, especially if you're going to the US a lot, that well, you can just bring lots of things with you, anything in your luggage, that's fine, right? It's not like you're bringing in like a box full of the same item to sell by setting up a store that might set up red flags in your brain, of course. No, you're bringing in lots of clothes, lots of stuff, but at some point it becomes really clear that you're bringing in items that have no intention of ever leaving the country again. No amount of your clothes is really gonna set off that flag, but I've seen people bring in, and I've done it myself, big bulky items that easily are never going to leave the country. Like it's so obvious when you bring it in, well, you're never gonna leave the country with this. I can't make an excuse. Of course, I'm not gonna leave the country with it. It's for my house, right? Like it's, okay, you got me, that's an import. So what is an import versus something else? An import is when you're bringing something, it doesn't matter if it's coming on a cargo ship, it doesn't matter if it's coming in your luggage, it doesn't matter if you're coming by plane or coming by, by road, if you're entering a country and the intent of the item is to not be immediately consumed or to return to the place that it came from, that it is an import. Anything that the intention that it is going to stay behind is an import. And that's all you really need to know. Now, not all imports are gonna be flagged. Not all imports are going to be controlled or taxed. Not all imports matter. But it is important to understand what is an import because by understanding the concept of what an import is and suddenly having this realization that we're actually, every time we're crossing the border, we are crossing the border as expats, chances are we're importing a bit of stuff, even if it's really small and no one's gonna catch us, it's what's happening. Every time I go to the US, I buy a new pair of shoes. Technically, I'm importing those shoes because I'm not leaving a pair of shoes behind. That's actually unfair. I often do actually leave a pair of shoes behind. I often wear my shoes until they're worn out and then I wear the completely worn out shoes on a flight to the US, throw them away in the US, buy brand new shoes and come back with those. So in actually a number of cases, even my shoes, I am actually cycling through and they're only in Nicaragua temporarily for about two years while I'm wearing them out. So that may be a bad example, but you can see where I'm going with this. There's a lot of things we buy in the US and bring to Nicaragua as a one-time thing. It's small, it's not a big deal. Nicaragua isn't worried about it, but that is an import. But when you get to larger numbers of items or items that clearly fall into a different category, I use the example all the time, of the water filter. No one is bringing in an industrial water filter into Nicaragua with the intent to only use it while traveling and then returning to the United States or Canada with that water filter. So that's all it takes, right? This is the mentality. But that's the thing that I think a lot of people are missing is understanding that you are going to be importing things all the time. You are legitimately bringing things that are only going one direction. Anytime a product come in that it comes in that is intended to only go one direction, only going to enter the country and stay, or it's very obvious that it makes no sense for it to ever leave again, you're going to be at risk of being caught for importation and you just need to be prepared for that and accept the fact that that is actually, in almost all cases, what you're actually doing. I've never once had someone do an import import, get caught for it, and then be able to come up with a case where they possibly weren't importing. It's always actually that they're importing. And when you import, there are fees to pay because when products enter a country under normal circumstances, most countries have some amount of tax or fee or duty or something on items entering their country. It may be really small, it may be no big deal at all, but they almost all have it and they want to get their money because, and this is where it gets really important. If you're a shop here, and we'll use Nicaragua as an example, you're a store and you want to sell shoes, 
right? You're selling, we'll say Skechers, because that's what I wear. You're a Skechers store and you want to sell shoes. You have to pay importation fees on those shoes. Not very much, but you have to pay something. There's some amount of tax and duty that you are paying to be a legitimate business in Nicaragua and you have paid for those shoes to come in. If an extranjero, if a foreigner is allowed to come in over the border and bring a whole bunch of Skechers shoes with them and isn't required to return to their home country with them, I understand you'll get away with it probably. But if you were to do that, you are importing and not paying the importation fee. You're getting a lower price per shoe than the person who's doing it legitimately as a business in the country. And that's where it's a real problem if a foreigner who's just traveling normally is allowed to bypass the taxes and fees that are levied on businesses in Nicaragua because it gives them an unfair advantage as foreigners who have no interest in the country potentially versus people who are citizens and the whole point of the tax system is to support their businesses and their ability to bring things into the country and of course if you there's all kinds of problems that arise from this right why are foreigners who don't even have any interest here able to make money on a, a, you know because you could sell things at lower cost at the same profit than the people who are Nicaraguan and doing all the things they're supposed to do right it really does create problems and I realize that you're often bringing in like one thing and you're like it's one thing I'm not opening a store but the point is, is that there's a mechanism for this. It's a truly an importation. There's basically every item that you could possibly want to import. There is a way to get it where there's an import duty involved legitimately, and that's what you're competing against. So you may save that one-time water filter. You say, but this is not something they sell in the country. And that's kind of true, but kind of not, because there's always a company that does importation of specialty items, and they are willing to bring that in for you, and you didn't use them because you're putting it in your luggage. And it's not really fair to the businesses that are offering legitimate services to charge them and not charge you if you bring it in in your luggage because all they would be doing is incentivizing you to skip using the legitimate tax paying services and obviously that makes no sense you never want to incentivize not paying your taxes you never want to make it the cheap option to work around the businesses of the country that benefits absolutely no one except for you and only a tiny bit like even that it's not very good what you want is to encourage the businesses in the country to set up infrastructures get things cheaper and cheaper and provide those goods in the country in a way that makes them so lucrative that they want to sell them at a low enough price that you want to buy them rather than taking the effort to go to another country put them in your luggage and bring it back even if it's not that big of a deal and you could be a few cents cheaper the effort you want it to be just enough that you'd rather buy it in country that is where the trying to get to and if there's an item that nobody handles for real fine this shouldn't be a problem paying the taxes on it but the point of all this is to just help you identify so you understand in your mind when it truly is an import versus something you're taking on vacation because i really believe a lot of people never having thought about imports as a concept you get it you get the word you know what it means but you're not really thinking about it and when you apply it to yourself and suddenly realize wait i'm not acting as a tourist in this regard. I'm acting as an importer. I am getting goods. I may be commingling them, right? My personal travel stuff that will leave with me along with stuff that I'm bringing in that won't leave with me. Okay, that's all together in my luggage. And maybe I need to think about the fact that I am importing and, and not be upset that I maybe get caught on it. Maybe identify when it will or will not be a problem. That's why you guys are asking me, is this thing an importation? Does it feel like an importation? How do you, that's what people are asking me to identify whether or not they're importing something. But in reality, they know whether it's going to leave the country or not. And if it's not going to leave the country, then the only thing I'm guessing is what are the chances they're going to get caught? Not whether or not they're doing something that should be taxed, but whether I think they're going to be flagged for it or not, which, yeah, maybe I have more insight into that than someone else does, but I don't know how much. It's really just thinking critically about how it works and how it must work, and you can kind of gauge it on your own. Maybe I've got a little bit, so I don't mind being asked the question, but I want to give you guys the tools to not have to ask it if I can. And if you understand when you are importing, what it means, and that clearly, clearly we all are all the time. It's just the nature of being an expat. The, an expat who isn't importing stuff on a regular basis is so rare. I don't even know anyone who falls into that category. It's not impossible, but it really comes close to it. And part of our benefit to the country is that we import things that other people can't get. And so they enter the economy and hopefully, you know, somehow it's benefiting everyone when we do so. So 
I hope that is educational for you. I hope that's a useful mental tool to have in your expat tool set. There's so many things that happen when you become an expat. That is the first time and possibly the only time in your life that you will run into some of these concepts, some of these situations, that sometimes having these discussions really helps to open our eyes as to what we're actually doing, how it's perceived by governments and borders and jurisdictions, and how it applies and, and matches other things in life. For example, you never think about the fact that you're literally competing with normal import-export businesses and they have a very strong interest in ensuring that you have to pay at very least the same taxes as them, if not more because you haven't prearranged and that you're not doing it at scale, they should get never penalized and maybe an advantage because they're investing in it and making it easier for the government and, and not taking as many resources to do the same thing. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel and all the work we do here and help me be able to get enough caffeine to talk this fast for this long without a break, then you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And as always, I'll see all of you tomorrow.